Deja Kelly entering the transfer portal is news all on its own, but it's got all Tar Heel basketball fans wondering, what's this mean for RJ Davis? You are Locked On Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? It's Tuesday, April 9th, 2024. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and you've joined us at The Place to get your Tar Heels content every single day. Thanks for making us your very first listen or watch, and a big special shout out to all you everydayers out there. I want to shout out our bracket challenge winner now that the national championship is in the books. The big winner is Tux Tar Heels, who finished with 1,430 points. That was good for being in the 99.4th percentile. Unreal stuff. Way to go, Tux Tar Heels. Second place, UNC Tar Heels BB. And tied for third was Larry Vision 5 and Lame Chalk Bracket. Pretty funny stuff there. By the way, congrats to UConn on back-to-back championships. They beat all six NCAA tournament opponents by 14 or more points. Carolina played them within 11. So I'm counting that as a moral victory. And so probably are you. It is Tuesday and that means it's time for Trivia Tuesday. I mentioned on Monday's show that Vince Carter and Walter Davis have been elected to the 2024 Hall of Fame class as the 13th and 14th Tar Heels. My question to you. Who are the other 12? We will answer that for you at the end of the show. Go ahead and start making your list. Speaking of the show, here's where we're headed today. We're going to talk about Deja Kelly entering the transfer portal. And with all due respect to Deja, more because of the potential implications on RJ. I want to talk about Coach Calipari going to Arkansas. And I know that maybe feels weird, but it's going to have ripple effects across all of college basketball. So I want to unpack potential effect on the Tar Heels. And then, speaking of effect on the Tar Heels, there was another potential Armando Baycott replacement that entered the transfer portal on Monday in the form of Umar Balo, so we'll get to him. Deja Kelly. The most texts and DMs and other messages I've received about anything in the first couple weeks of this offseason happened on Monday when Deja Kelly announced that she was going to enter the transfer portal out of North Carolina. Why? With all due respect to Deja, it was not about her. For those unaware, Deja Kelly, for a good while now, has been dating none other than RJ Davis. So the reason everyone is messaging me, texting me, is because of the possible RJ Davis implications of Deja Kelly not staying at North Carolina for one more year. Does that sound far-fetched? I promise you, it's not. There is a greater than 0% chance that Deja's decision has an impact on RJ's decision-making, or maybe that there have already been decisions made and that Deja is now acting on those decisions. So uh, let's look quickly at the Deja side of this. Come with me there. She is the sixth uh, female women's basketball Tar Heel to enter the transfer portal this offseason. Sounds a whole lot like the guys last offseason, but obviously she is the most consequential of that group and has confirmed it for our guy R.L. Bynum from Tar Heels Tribune. So Deja is definitely out, Um, is going to utilize her COVID eligibility as RJ could. It's just that she's going to do it at a not North Carolina school. Um, P.S. Carolina also on Monday picked up a transfer commitment from Richmond guard Grace Townsend. So that's great news to do it. But again, the big question for the vast majority of us here today is this. What, if anything, does Deja's departure mean for RJ? And as odd and as off the beaten path as that may sound to you, I promise you it is a legitimate question to ask. Now, before we go down that trail, let me be very clear about something. I do not expect RJ Davis to transfer. That That is not why we're having this conversation. He could, but I, I like that to me seems like the least possible scenario. So I'm not saying Deja's leaving and so RJ is going to transfer as well. <laughs> What I'm saying is that my expectation is that RJ Davis 
is either going to return to Chapel Hill or take his shot at professional opportunities, whether that is the NBA or overseas or whatever it is. And as I've said, and I'm going to continue to say, I think it would be wise, and I expect that RJ, probably along with Harrison Ingram, and I think Elliot Cadeau should as well, honestly, at the very least, declare for the NBA draft while maintaining college eligibility so they can get feedback from the NBA. If you had the opportunity to get feedback from your employer about how you could be a more viable employee, wouldn't you want to do that? Yeah, all day long. I want to do that. So I think RJ should go do that and at the least learn more about what his potential employer thinks of his game. So that that for me is what we're having this conversation about. Not is RJ going to enter the transfer portal like Deja before him, but rather does Deja's decision have an impact on RJ either returning or deciding to go pro? And and, and here's part of this conversation. This legitimately happens a lot. When we're trying to figure out, like with a high school commit, for example, where is this high school young man or woman going to commit? A lot of times, what insiders will do, what um, scouts will do, what others trying to get that information will do, is go figure out, does this recruit have a significant other? And if so, Either where does that significant other live or where do they go to school or where are they going to go to school? Because that legitimately plays. I mean, you think about this just in, not even with student athletes, like in the general populace, how often does somebody follow their significant other to a school or to another location? It happens all the time. And now it's not just us talking about that with high school recruiting. We talk about it and look at it all the time now with transfer portal recruiting. Oh, player, player X is in the transfer portal and considering these five schools. Well, we also know, let's say it's the quarterback. Let we know that this quarterback's girlfriend goes to Ole Miss. So that's going to grow Ole Miss's chances in our eyes of where that quarterback might go to school. That's a completely hypothetical situation. Just the first position in school that popped into my head. And so like, that's why this is a legitimate thing for us to think about that there's nothing that says RJ will or has to do the same thing as Deja, but there is a very real world and possibility that RJ could ultimately decide to go wherever it is that Deja lands while he's training, if he decides to go to the draft or or whatever. Now, I think the positive side of this for Tar Heels fans is they, in my opinion, you know, obviously I know nothing about their relationship other than what we see on social media and and things of that nature. But it just feels like from what we see, at least the picture they're painting is that they've been together for a long time now. They seem very happy together and have a solid relationship, a relationship that could stand the test of long distance while Deja is is trying the opportunity of one more year elsewhere to maybe uh, continue her NIL opportunities, to maybe land at a place, with all due respect to Carolina's women's team and Coach Banghart, at a place that just is more ready to win right now. And that's not saying that Carolina won't do that next year, but it's just not been what has happened to these last couple of years in Chapel Hill to the level that I think Deja and the team obviously wants to. Whereas RJ has seen some of that. You know, the the team didn't get as far as he wanted to this year, but clearly they've made it very far. You know, you think three NCAA tournaments ago, they went to the national championship this year, you know, um, again, falling short, but making it to the sweet 16 and all that. And so um, their situation from the men's team to the women's team is different, but just keep your eye on the fact that Deja leaving does have, in my opinion, a greater than 0% chance to impact the decision that RJ ultimately makes. What is that going to be? I don't know, but I just need to make sure that we all understand that it's a possibility. All right. Speaking of making moves, John Calipari out of the blue on national championship Eve left the blue for the red of Arkansas. Is this going to mean anything for the Tar Heels? I'll unpack that and talk about it coming up in just a second. 
right after I tell you about FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA and the NHL. Baseball is in full swing and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 win or lose. You can bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks all on an app that's safe and secure and super easy to use. By the way, with the 2024 basketball season now over, FanDuel has already put out their national championship odds for this time next year, the 2025 national champion. Here are those odds. This first one's going to hurt a little bit. Duke leads the way at plus 1,100 because they win the offseason again. All right, whatever. Kansas second at plus 1,200. And then UConn, Carolina, Alabama, and Houston are all tied for the third best odds at plus 1,500. So you want to get in on that? What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Crazy and unexpected news in the coaching carousel world of college basketball that happened on Sunday evening. There we were. I had already recorded Tar Heels. I had already recorded Locked on College Basketball. Was ready to go. Had even done a segment on Locked on College Basketball talking about, does anybody want the coaching job at Arkansas? Chris Beard had already turned him down. Jerome Tang from Kansas State had already turned him down. And they were turning to they were starting to interview Mississippi State's head coach, Chris Jans, who's a great basketball coach, by the way, but it's like, that's where Arkansas is turning. And then out of the blue, there starts to be this rumor that John Calipari is talking to Arkansas. And over the course of like an hour, it gained this massive and quick momentum. And before you knew it, it wasn't just some outlandish rumor. It was a real thing. Now, I'm not here to, to, to litigate that or talk about it or any of that kind of stuff because that's that's for other shows. But the reason I bring it up on here is because I want to ask the question, how does this John Calipari move and the resulting domino effects affect North Carolina and, frankly, the game of college basketball as a whole? Like, are, are there any general big picture topics about this move that do affect the Tar Heels. So that's that's what I want to look at as we get into this and, and, and kind of talk about it. Because sometimes there are things that happen elsewhere around the country that just have a ripple effect throughout the whole national landscape. And to me, this is one of those moments. So let's look at a couple different pieces to this. Number one, we have had in the last several years what I would call a seismic shift in coaching at the upper levels of college basketball. Let's think back to April 1st, April Fool's Day of several years ago. Roy Williams, out of thin air, out of the blue, retires. In comes Hubert Davis next year's year four. Then we get the news that Mike Krzyzewski is going to be in his last year. Next year is year three for John Shire. Jay Wright next year is going is out at Villanova. Next year is going to be year three for Kyle Neptune. And now John Calipari is out at Kentucky, and we still don't know who's going to be the coach as of the time that I record this. Uh, we do know that it ain't going to be Nate Oates from Alabama because he definitively said no to that on Monday night just leading up to the championship game. But it, that means basically in the past, in the course of the past four college basketball seasons, Carolina, Duke, Villanova, and Kentucky will all change head coaches. And, and when it's that level of blue bloodery, and I, know, I don't know if you include Villanova in blue bloods or not, but you, you get the point. They've been at the top of, of college basketball recently. Like that's a lot of shift at the very, very top of this sport in terms of head coaching. And so that that alone indicates some changes. And I think a lot of it is just where we're at right now. I think with Coach Williams, Coach K, and Jay Wright, it all had a lot to do with the shifting landscape with NIL and Transfer Portal and all that. With Coach Cal, it's just he, things were done at Kentucky. It was not feasible anymore. So there, there is that kind of big picture conversation about the coaching carousel turnover. The next thing in terms of effect on Carolina is the one and done nature of what we've seen at Kentucky for a long time and Duke for a slightly less long time than we saw it at Kentucky. Right now, 
Duke is still, at least from my purview, all in on the one and done thing. I know they had a little more returning guys this year, but that was just basically because they hadn't been good enough to leave for the NBA in their freshman year. And that would be like Tyrese Proctor, Kyle Filipowski, and Mark Mitchell, who all came back to Duke. Um, but Duke is still very much in on the one and done factory thing. Um, Kentucky, we don't know if they will continue to be that because we don't know who their coach is or what his philosophy will be. We also don't know if Coach Cal is going to try to hold on to that now that he's going to be at Arkansas. So my question is, and this is the second of three effects uh, on Carolina and the national college basketball landscape, is will Duke be the only one-and-done factory remaining? Because to me, that is a ship that ship that sailed, a ship that sailed, a ship that sailed a couple of years ago now. And Coach Cal at Kentucky and Coach Shire at Duke have not been able to wrap their brains around how they got to change and improve and get better with that. And consequently, Duke hasn't been to a Final Four since 2015. That's what we're talking about. Duke's had more recent success, clearly. But um, so, the, and then the reason that has an impact on Carolina is. If Cal finally wises up to, oh, I should utilize the transfer portal better, get old and stay old, does that mean that there are more of these elite high school talents to go around? Because the Carolina side of it is I don't want to load up on them, but I would like one to two of those top flight elite high school players basically year in and year out. I want to populate the Tar Heels with returning studs and a couple transfer complementary pieces who are also older in nature. Because I think that is the recipe now for a highly successful college basketball roster. So as you think ahead to 2025, for example, I know that Coach Davis has been all in on multiple of these top recruits. And the question becomes, can you land two of them, keep around a couple of your homegrown guys, and then maybe get a couple others in the transfer portal? So that's what I'm wondering about with the one and done factory of all this. Does Coach Cal change things and does Kentucky try to keep doing that as well? And that leads me into the third potential effect on the Tar Heels is that is the immediate potential recruiting that comes because of the Coach Cal move. And I mean that both on the Kentucky and the Arkansas side. We've already begun to see it. Now, Adu Thiero from Kentucky, he was in the transfer portal before this news broke, but already on Monday, the, literally the day after all this happened, Aaron Bradshaw, one of their big freshmen from this year who was hurt, didn't really have as much of a productive year as a lot of people expected, entered the transfer portal. Now, there are some rumblings and rumors that he was already thinking about it even before Coach Cal's news, but I got to imagine that that cemented the decision. And so immediately, Monday, boom, he's in the transfer portal. And it comes in the shape of their incoming freshman class as well. Carter Knox the younger brother of Kevin Knox, who also went to Kentucky, immediately on Monday reopens his commit, his uh, recruitment decommits from Kentucky. Now he might go back depending on who the coach is, but it's enough to move him off of that. So are we going to see more of that from Kentucky's current roster and their incoming freshmen? And if so, I think that Coach Davis, probably along with just about every other coach in America, are going to just do some due diligence. I don't know that there's anybody that they would want. Maybe a do the arrow. I kind of like him more than Aaron Bradshaw, but I remember that Carolina was in on Kevin Knox, Carter's older brother. Maybe they want to have a little conversation with Carter. I don't know, but it at least raises the possibility of that conversation. As for the Arkansas side of things, there's also some potential recruiting benefit to coach Cal going because you got to think, Coach Cal is going to try to bring some of his Kentucky commits with him or current Kentucky roster with him. But you also got to think that he's going to try to keep some of that roster intact. Well, right now, at the time we talk, what's well, actually Tuesday, <laughs> as I record it late in the night, we already know that Tra Trayvon Brazil is going pro. And he even basically was like announced that, I think, formally on Monday. And so like, even with the Cal news, he's like, yeah, I got to go. I, I get it. Coach Cal's coming. I'm out. Um, Tremont Mark had just entered the transfer portal as well. We saw him up close and personal and saw what he could do when Carolina played Arkansas back on Thanksgiving week in the Bahamas. Um, if RJ Davis is out the door, 
Not saying he is, not saying he's not. But if he is, is somebody like Tremont Marks somebody that you look at? Or does Coach Cal go hard after him to try to keep him? I don't know. But now that is the kind of thing that's out there in a possibility. Also, Arkansas, just their last remaining recruit decommitted on Monday as well. So right now, Coach Cal has nobody on his roster. Now, he probably looks at that and it's like, all right, great. I got a clean slate. I'll do whatever I want. Fine. Cool. Knock yourself out. But there is an opportunity, both on the Kentucky and Arkansas side, for Carolina to make some phone calls if they're interested. And again, do some due diligence to see what might be available. Speaking of what might be available in the transfer portal, yesterday on Monday show, we had literally just talked about the possibility of some Armando Baycott replacements. And guess what? Another one entered the transfer portal on Monday from a school that Carolina is a little bit familiar with right now for somebody going the other way. We'll talk about that in just a second. On Monday, Arizona's big man, Umar Balo, entered the transfer portal. And it's interesting, when I first started looking at Balo, and I've I've watched him quite a bit this year, more than I typically would watch Arizona, both because of my Locked On College basketball responsibilities and because Caleb Love being at Arizona, I just happened to watch Arizona more than I usually would. And and, and from those moments, my initial note that I wrote here, I, I said, I'll say this right off the top. I would take him but I believe there are better fit options to replace Armando Baycott. Now let's talk about why. But the more I started to wrap my brain around some of what he could add, I've kind of come back around on Balo a little bit as I've prepared for this conversation here on our Tuesday episode of Locked on Tar Heels. But here's what it's all going to come down to, folks. It's going to all depend on what Hubert Davis is going to be looking for in terms of roster construction to try to replace Armando. If he's looking for a basically Armando replacement, Umar Balo is your guy. If he's looking for more of a stretch five who can get out and shoot a little bit, Umar Balo is not your guy. Now, we all know that North Carolina is going to need some beef in the post because Baycott's gone and James Aconquo entered the transfer portal. And Jalen Washington has a lot of great things he does, but having size to move around ACC centers is not one of them. So Carolina needs somebody with beef and meat and girth, and Umar Balo is in that mold. So let me unpack for you some of what Balo does, and then you can make those decisions for yourself. Do you think he would be a good fit with this roster? Yes or no. But ultimately, as you always know, it's not up to us. It's up to the coaching staff. So Umar Balo is from the country of Mali. I love that. Super cool. Um, and uh, how ironic would it be, by the way, with Caleb Love having just gone to Arizona last year, if Arizona sent somebody, it's like a player to be named later situation, if Umar Balo came back to North Carolina next year. This dude, you talk about Armando Baycott, big man replacement. He's bigger than Armando, both height and width. Seven footer. 260 in terms of what his numbers were on Arizona's roster last year. Balo has one year of eligibility remaining. This is actually going next season will actually be his sixth year in college. He was at Gonzaga two years, redshirted his first year, and then basically went with Tommy Lloyd from Gonzaga to Arizona. For those who are unaware, Tommy Lloyd is Arizona's new coach. And he had been previously an assistant under Mark Few at Gonzaga. So Umar Bala was there. They basically went together. He's played the last three years at Arizona. And now, just like RJ Davis could, has the opportunity to utilize COVID eligibility. Something I really like about the prospect of Umar Bala is this prospect I've been talking about a lot. Get old, stay old. He would help with that. A veteran who's mature, who's been on the pack first team all Pac-12 the past two seasons, who was on the Pac-12 all defensive team this past season. I mean, he is a big man who knows what he does well, who knows what he doesn't do well, and just like stays in his lane. For example, literally never attempted a three-point shot in college in his career so far. That's what we're talking about. So what I want to do is I've broken this up into the good, the bad, and the average kind of in between that. I'll give you some career numbers and then kind of give my thought on Balo ultimately. The good, and I've got several things listed here 
The biggest good for me is field goal percentage. Again, not shooting threes. This man lives in the lane where he is a career. This is not just last year, a career 64.6% shooter on all field goals. And last year he had a career high 65.8%. So it's going up. That was good for fifth in the nation. Unreal stuff for what it's worth, by the way, Vlad Golden from FAU, who we've talked about as a potential Armando replacement was third in the nation in field goal percentage last year. So let me just to give you some context on how good that 65.8% was this past year, Armando 54.4% on field goal this year. So Umar Balo was 11 percentage points better than Armando this year. So, you know, you, you think about like one of the few frustrations that I ever felt with Armando is just missing a lot of bunnies, missing some dunks, like that key dunk against Alabama, unfortunately. But he had multiple others this year. Balo, when when he's in by the rim, you he is scoring on you, you know, nearly two-thirds of the time. I mean, that's great stuff. So that would be a welcome change, dominance in and around the paint. Next on the good, Umar Balo has is not a, a double-double machine at the same level as Armando Baycott, but for the first time in his career this past season, he averaged a double-double, 12.9 points, which was slightly down from the year before, but also 10.1 rebounds, which was up from eight-something in the, the previous year. So uh, love to see Balo, uh, you know, while he's not scoring as much this past year, really brought up that rebounding average, and I think that is critical to be aware of. Here's another thing that I really like about what Balo brings to the table. A lot of big men, especially his size, are pretty turnover prone. Not the case with Umar Balo. Doesn't turn it over as much as what you see a prototypical, you know, back to the basket center. Just 1.2 turnovers per game for his career. So that's not just like, hey, he had growth in this year, 1.2 turnovers. Like his entire college career averages 1.2 turnovers per game. I can get on board with that. Rebounding. I talked about how that's come up. This past season, he was 15th in the na- in the nation in rebounds per game, and he was 17th in the nation in offensive rebounds per game. Uh, so is able to bring some of that Armando Baycott offensive rebounding prowess. I love that not only is Balo seven foot tall, but he's also got a nice, good wingspan. He's good with both hands, can go up with his right or his left. You don't get up to just shy of 66% on your free field goal attempts, excuse me, by being good with one hand. He can do it good with both. Both, And what I like, also, you, you look at his size and his numbers and you think, oh, he probably just bullies his way in the paint. He does, but also, Balo has the ability not only to just be a powerful post player, but also has some good touch and finesse that he can operate with as well. So those are some of the good categories where I'm like, yes, all in on Balo on those things. In terms of, where he's kind of average, but you know, not great, but not awful. The first one that jumps out at me is blocks. You know, when you think of a seven footer, I'm like, especially one with girth, I'm like, buddy, I, w- I want to see you blocking a lot of shots. But because of that size, he's not this massive high flying above the rim kind of guy. But this past season averaged 1.3 blocks per game. Again, kind of average. Um, that tied for 148th in the nation. So it's, it's not awesome, but I mean, he is... Uh, changing shots, but let me just remind you about this. And this is where I, I kind of vacillate back and forth with his blocks. Similar to Leaky Black, defense is not just about blocks and steals. It's about doing the pre-work. Remember, I said Umar Balo on the all Pac-12 defensive team this year. So just, just keep in mind, he's doing other things to affect the game defensively beyond just blocking shots. The other place that he's average is he's he's not slow afoot, but he's certainly not fleet afoot. So I would put him in, in his quickness in the middle. And then the bad. I've got two things I want to point out, you know, because I, I want to be fair in my evaluations of all these guys. I don't want to just say, hey, this is great. Let's go get him. Two areas that I'd like to see growth. The, the, the like real like, oh, is free throw shooting. Umar Balo for his career is 56.4%. This past year, was under 50%. He shot 49.5% from the free throw line this past year on 5.3 attempts per game. For a North Carolina team that for the past couple years 
has been seeing some of the highest free throw percentages literally in program history. That is an eyesore that the Tar Heels just cannot bear to have. So that's something. That number has to come up for somebody that if Carolina is going to go out and get him, they're going to rely on him in the post. They're going to operate through him a lot. And that brings me to the other point. You can't operate through him as much as you'd like to because his career assist percentage is, or uh, uh, assist per game average, excuse me, is 0.8 assists per game for his career. That tells me that while Umar Balo scores at a high efficiency level when he gets the ball, that he's also a little bit of a black hole. You know, I prefer a center. I'm thinking of somebody like DJ Burns from NC State, who to me was the best passer on their team this year. Um, And so that's what I'm looking for is, yes, somebody that can go get a bucket inside when you need it, but that also will, like when he's doubled, is able to make the right pass to the right person at the right time. Less than an assist per game for his career tells me that he's not always doing that very well. So that would be an area of growth I'd like to see. In terms of like career highs, let's start with points. Umar Balo had 30 points in a game versus Creighton last year. And if that doesn't mean anything to you, Creighton has Ryan Kalkbrenner, who's also a legit like seven footer, maybe 6'11", but is like the multiple time Big East defensive player of the year, not just on the defensive team, like defensive player of the year for the Big East. And Balo went out and put 30 on him. So that's very encouraging to me. Um, now for his career, he's only got eight games in which he scored 20 or more points. I, w- I would like to see that number higher, but all right. Um, in terms of double doubles, I talked about that earlier. He does, he's not like in Armando Baycott territory, but he does have 34 career double doubles. So a very solid number in that regard. And as I said, that number has been coming up lately in terms of rebounding. He does have one career game of 20 or more rebounds had 21 this past season against FAU. And I bring that up because that's over 20 rebounds against Vlad Golden, who is a fellow true seven footer from FAU, who by the way, is also in the transfer portal right now and was third in the nation in field goal percentage this past year. So just keep all that in mind. Um, So, you know, it's doing some good things in the interior, but that, that is, if Carolina is going to get him, that's what you're looking for is a true honest to goodness uh, center who's playing back to the basket. That's what you're getting with Umar Balo. So if Carolina was to go in on him, what would it mean? For me, it would mean that you have to have shooters everywhere else, or else we're going to see what's happened to Carolina some of the past two years where players start to sag off an Elliot Cadeau, right? Off a leaky black. Uh, not this year, obviously, but in recent years, because that's not going to be Balo. So other teams. <laughs> are going to try to surround him in the paint and make life very difficult if the other four guys can't hit from outside. So that's something you just got to be aware of, meaning Elliot Cadeau has got to be ready to shoot, meaning you need somebody like Cade Tyson to replace Cormac Ryan, meaning if RJ Davis isn't back, you got to be having somebody out there that can knock down uh, three-point shots from outside. Like You can't have a lineup that, at least right now as you think about it, is Elliot Cadeau, Seth Trimble, and Umar Balo. That's three not very reliable three-point shooters on the floor together. And in today's college basketball world, that's not going to cut it. So that's just something to keep in mind if North Carolina is going to get Umar Balo. I think he is somebody worth taking a very long and hard look at. But again, ultimately, it all comes down to what Hubert Davis's preference is for building his roster for next season. Trivia Tuesday answer. I mentioned on Monday's show that Vince Carter and Walter Davis have been the 13th and 14th Tar Heels elected to the Hall of Fame. And the question is, who are the other 12? Let me just rattle off their names quickly. We'll see how many of you of them you all have. Ben Carnavali, Frank McGuire, Dean Smith, Billy Cunningham, Bob McAdoo, Larry Brown, James Worthy, Roy Williams, some guy named Mike Jordan, (laughs) Charlie Scott, Bobby Jones, and most recently, George Carl. So there's your 12 other Tar Heels who are already in the Hall of Fame now along with Vince Carter and Walter Davis. Man, what a list of Carolina royalty that is. All right, folks, great show today. Can't be, can't wait to be back with you tomorrow where we'll look at some way too early top 25 rankings for next year, some national championship odds for next year. I want to get into all of that a little more um, as we go throughout the week. I want to take a deeper look at 
who might still be out the door for North Carolina before this offseason is all said and done. We'll make some guesses on that. If you're not part of the Locked on Tar Heels Discord community, man, we'd sure love to have you. Come on in and join this offseason so you can stay connected to all things Carolina, even through the summer and early fall months. We'd love for you to be part of that community. It's free to join. The link's in the show notes. If you haven't subscribed to Locked on Tar Heels on audio and video, please do that. We're on every audio platform. Whatever's your favorite, go subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, it's literally just hit that button right down there in the bottom corner. And if you haven't hit the bell to get notifications when shows drop or when I go live with breaking news as we find it out this offseason, you're going to want to hit that so you can tap right on in. Gang, it's always great to be together. Why? Because it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. We'll talk again on Wednesday, but until then, peace.